Hi, and welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast, where heart and mind align. I am your host, Amber, and today I have the honor of being joined by Stefan Strauss. Stefan is an amazing heart leader who comes to us all the way from Germany. He has dedicated his life and his career to turning businesses around from a very heart-centered place. He has come up through corporations and fundamentally found a way to see people and understand how to utilize that human potential in a way that it can actually benefit both the person and the organization. He has over 30 years and a global track record of just turning around, transforming and innovating growth services and technology and service-based businesses. And just to make sure I don't misquote any of the amazing things that this man has done, I'm gonna take a moment to just read a little bit from this bio that he has sent us, but you can find all of it on the website and underneath of this podcast because Stefan has founded and is the CEO of a transformation advisory firm called Smart Planet Ventures. In this, he advises CEOs, entrepreneurs, investors, as well as corporations and startups and NGOs worldwide on how to take what he has learned through his own experience and through studies and how to turn around organizations and really reach people to help find the best within them. He has a passion to build a more sustainable, inclusive, and diverse economy by integrating positive impacts on people, the planet, and how to pull prosperity out of that. So when you have someone like this who's agreed to come on to your show and talk, we want to take more of the time to listen. So I want to bring him on right now so we can start to really hear his wisdom. So Stefan, thank you for being here. I know thank it's you. late where you are, so I really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Amber, for your uh, most kind and, and generous introduction. And thanks very much for having me. Oh. Well, I want to start by really understanding when you say, when we're talking about reaching into like human potential, right? And what human potential can do for a business or an organization, especially as a CEO and what you've done in your career as a CEO and going in and helping organizations. What does that mean? What does that look like? from a CEO standpoint, because I know sometimes CEOs can get a really bad, bad rap from those who are not at that level or even in the executive level. So when you have someone who does come in and see the human potential and desire to reach out to staff, what does that look like from that level? I know it's a hard question. Um, it's a very big question, and I, I try to dive into that a little bit with telling you what I found when I was mandated with um, a, a turnaround situation, a transformation situation. Um, and um, so over the last 15 years of my career, I was mostly tasked with um, situations, dealing with situations as a CEO where um, a company was loss-making, underperforming. Um, and uh, I came to realize in all of those cases that the root cause for that malperformance again and again was, uh, was culture. And culture is, uh, is an effect of leadership. So the leadership style practiced before I came in was pretty much consistently, it was always command and control and threat and fear based. And um, that in combination with high low, highly, highly siloed organizations um, created an environment where organizations were not able to, to perform. 
um, on any level. Um, and it, this typically finds its expression in, um, in dysfunctional behavior that you, you would find in an organization, like absence of trust, fear of conflict, for example. You get this defensive behavior, this cover my butt uh, yeah. behavior, the, a lack of commitment, high stress levels um, that you would see in ill health, high rates of, of absenteeism, um, up to inner resignation uh, of people that you would encounter. Uh, you would find avoidance of uh, accountability, this typical finger pointing phenomenon. Yeah, it was him, not me. Oh yeah, us, um, us versus them, right? Yes, exactly. Um, inattention to results up to the point of utter sabotage. So these are typical, um, typical effects of that kind of leadership uh, behavior, yeah? So threat and fear-based leadership systems create cultures um, where, uh, where, where people who are good people, <laughs> originally, I think everyone is, is good and joyful and loving, but people get driven into a kind of behavior that is, uh, that is dysfunctional in these kind of situations. So, so this was always pretty much the root cause of um, um, unclear uh, strategic direction, um, lack of collaboration, um, lack of creativity and innovation, bad execution, and um, um, leading those companies into even even into into distress, right? Um, and Peter Drucker, the, the the famous economist, once said, uh, "Culture eats strategy for breakfast." And this is what I have encountered again and again. So you can have the greatest strategy, you can have the greatest technology. In the end, it's people who make it happen. In the end, it's people who develop a technology. In the end, it's people who develop a strategy and execute on it. And if that doesn't happen, if people don't have the room, the space to feel safe and trusted, um, you will lose people's engagement. So, um, the bottom line of, of, of that is um, a good culture is uh, the strongest competitive advantage that you can have as a business. A bad culture is a competitive business risk, very clearly. Um, uh, so uh, any sensible investor um, into a company, might it be startup or, or mature, will always place 50% at least of their attention into uh, assessing leadership, uh, uh, team, and culture. And as a CEO, um, as you just mentioned it, there are basically there are three key tasks, or key focus points that you have. It's people, culture, and strategy, right? And in that order. This episode of the Heart Leader Podcast was brought to you by Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is one of the nation's leading boutique search and interim resources firms and has been recognized as a leader in identifying and providing access to top talent for clients since 1984. Whether it's a company preparing to go to the next level or a candidate looking for better opportunities, Stephen Douglas keeps the focus on the needs of the people they serve. They specialize in connecting the right talent to a company's needs while also understanding what the market demands. To learn more about this amazing organization, visit them at stephendouglas.com. The key to a strong culture then is um, trust and safety. When people feel safe and trusted, um, it opens up space and it uh, drives people engagement. It drives energy, it drives commitment. It boosts well-being um, and it drives creativity and innovation. And as a role, as a result, an organization uh, is successful and uh, performs well and has a competitive advantage. So what I did um, when I came into such uh, organizations, I never focused on the numbers. I always focused on people and on building and developing and nurturing environments. Um, uh, environments of trust um, and the numbers in terms of financial performance came as a result of that. So uh, um, 
that was that was my approach that always <clears throat> um, led me to be uh, successful. So people were your investment. Yes, most definitely. Yes. How did organizations respond when you would come in and flip the script like that? I mean, that's not a normal, at least in my experience here, that was never necessarily readily received when you would walk in and say, well, I understand the financials are our focus right now, but why don't we change that and make people the focus and then let financial reward be the outcome of the investment in the people. Because it wasn't always an immediate return on that investment, and we were looking at the short game, not the long game, it wasn't always necessarily like, yes, let's do that. Let's, let's just make that investment right now. Then it, was, it wasn't received the way that one would anticipate because we weren't looking at the long game. So how did you bridge that gap? How did you communicate to those that you were walking into and being in service with and of that, hey, this is going to pay multiple in the long run. We might have to take a short hit, but in the long run, this is really going to get us where we want to go. Mm. Yeah, well, as you say, this is this is a journey that you embark on and you have to be aware of that. This is not a quick fix. And people have been led in a in a uh, in a, a f- threat and fear based system, command and control. They will not immediately trust, and it takes a while um, for you to uh, to role model the kind of behavior to um, to share very openly um, what this is all about, and to involve people, engage people in a way that builds actually trust. Um, so I always find that, um, this kind of journey is, is, um, is, is like a, uh, an expedition into uncharted territory where you go up a mountain and you, uh, you form the team and you need to make sure that everyone knows and understands where you are and where you want to go. And then you have to make sure that <clears throat> everyone is able to come along, is able to uh, contribute, um, is, is safe, um, and um, uh, understands um, how we are progressing, right? Um, and it starts with sharing very openly, um, coming back to the business environment, where you are um, in, in all of those situations that I came in, people had not been told the truth. They didn't know uh, in what a dangerous, disastrous, uh, money losing situation uh, the business was. So this was the first, the first um, order of the day, basically, sharing again and again, um, the truth, very authentically, very openly, very honestly. And um, um, obviously then to, to provide a vision of where we need to go. And then it starts with the joint work. It's nothing that can be enforced top down, but it's a, it's a collaborative act. Um, and I would call this, it's, it's a kind of uh, joint uh, why, how, and what work. So first of all, um, you, you need to start involving people um, right, from the, right from the start. Um, um, and it starts with jointly developing or reviewing what is our North Star? What is our purpose? Why are we around and why should we are around for much longer? I mean, what's the reason for that? Um, what kind of value do we create and provide? Uh, to our customers, uh, but also to our other stakeholders, to our community. Uh, and and um, what are the values uh, that are guiding us? So this is something that needs to be um, built and developed uh, together right from the start. 
And the second one, uh, the second step is pretty much um, how, how do we want to work? You know, what are our guardrails? How do we uh, want to structure our cooperation and our communication? Um, and um, what is our culture uh, supposed to look like? And the third step, uh, the, the what work is then really about meeting people where they are and who they are uh, and enabling everyone to show up wholly as a human being. And you just mentioned it, Amber. Um, I always perceive people um, like clouds and in highly overstructured companies or highly siloed companies, people are, those clouds are then being forced into a chest of drawers. So what you get actually, you, you, you get a stamp out of a whole personality, but the whole personality gets reduced to a little box that is supposed to fulfill a certain function or play a certain role. And this is, um, this is nothing that I ever believed in. So the question is, how do you enable people to show up wholly? How do you um, also take approaches to designing an organization that allows for people to show up wholly? And not to check in in the morning at the reception desk at nine o'clock and leave the half or even more of that humanity behind and check out again and pick it up when they go home. This is nothing that would work. Um, so this is what I mean about showing holy. People need to have the opportunity to bring their whole humanity to work, which also means they bring their whole potential to work. And uh, uh, one of the, the, the basic attitudes that are important to me here, um, and I've always looked for that kind of attitude when I hired people into leading positions is, you need to have an attitude of people are not who, who or what they are, but what they can be. Because when you take people who they are, you make them dull, you, can, you restrict them, you constrain them, uh, you contain them to a snapshot that they might be at the moment, but if you, if you um, alleviate people, if you make them more of what they are today, if you open that room, you open the space for development, you open the space for um, unfolding potential. And this is what I think one of the key tasks of any leader needs to be. You need to, uh, you need to approach people and meet people in, based on that kind of attitude. And with that in mind, I always hired for key leadership positions. I always hired by attitude over competence. So this kind of attitude is way more important than a certain functional competence that somebody might need. Might it be a, someone in finance? Might it be someone in operations? Because that can be learned. Yeah, you can also structure teams in, in ways that they um, balance their strengths and weaknesses. But this kind of attitude is, is, is game changing and is really the, the basis for any kind of success. Amazing. So it sounds like there's so many different components that you would go in and look at knowing that it wasn't time bound, but you were building a team that had an open view of, all right, it isn't only about skill set. It is also about looking at the whole potential of a person and everything about their life. It is also okay. about me and my potential and everything about my life yeah. and integrating as a team and knowing the mission, the vision, the values of the organization and what that contributes to the community and to the world. So it's a whole integrative process within the person, within the organization, within the city, within the planet. Like it just goes in and out. It's like a breathing organism yes. all the way around. Yeah, right. 
what led you to that? Because I would not say that that's the most common view. It's not never happening, but I have not run into many who view an organization as a living organism in that type of a way. What led you to that? How did you get to this space in your own perspective? Having seen what it does to organizations and people if you don't do it that way, having experienced this kind of threat and fear-based and command and control-based systems, um, and having met so many people in those organizations who, um, who have been reduced to a particle, a fragment of who they are, and it's, 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 it's something that creates suffering for individuals. It creates uh, stress. Um, it's uh, up to, up to um, stress-induced illnesses uh, that go rampant in these kind of organizations. And you get uh, the kind of behavior that I just alluded to, dysfunctional behavior, where people do things Good people do bad things all of a sudden, you know, non-compliance uh, behavior with laws and regulations, um, doing all kinds of things in order to make up for something that is expected of them, um, which is um, then executed in a way that isn't based in, in, in enabling people, but putting pressure on them. And then people try to find ways in order to keep their job and do what is expected of them. But you then they move into sometimes into areas which are um, illegitimate or uh, worst case illegal. Uh, and you get these kind of behaviors that we've seen over the last few years and decades in many companies. Might it be, uh, uh, might it be something like Dieselgate uh, might it be uh, some kind of collusion? Might it be antitrust uh, behavior uh, in terms of, you know, um, uh, agreeing pricings across uh, competitive companies? All these kind of things uh, are, are typical um, symptoms of uh, people having been pressured in organizations. Um, and instead of opening the spaces for creativity and innovation, um, they were reduced to something and not giving the opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to do what they could do, right? Yeah. So and this is something that I've experienced many times and um, it's, it's the, the, the individual and the organizational suffering that actually um, then I, I, for some reason, was uh, always quite sensitive to, and it drove me to um, the, uh, the conclusion there needs to be a different approach. There de needs to be a more humane and human-centric approach uh, to leading that. And I started trying out that in my early leadership uh, functions and found that uh, it worked better than anything else and it was authentic to myself um, and um, then I developed my own approach over time and uh, grew with the, uh, the growing mandates that I got. Can you talk to us about your approach? I'm sorry? Can you talk to us about your own approach? I, I believe it's rolled into a, a new flow that we've seen called the heartful leadership. Is it the one in the same or is it a separate approach? No, it's basically that. Um, and it's, uh, it's basically something that um, has three three tiers, I would say, three levels. And it always starts with oneself. So the first, the first uh, part of that is um, recognizing your own suffering, being aware of your own suffering and your own um, humanity, of your own faults, of your own traumas, 
and um, uh, st starting to work on that. Uh, we all have our own own uh, traumas and uh, our own journeys that have brought us to who we are today. Um, and uh, being aware of um, what am I carrying around that is or that has set me off in a certain uh, direction or a trajectory um, is probably the first step. And the second step then is starting to, to manage um, these uh, basic functionalities, you know, body, mind, heart, and soul, in order to uh, come to, a, a, in order to, to progress, to become a better version of, of myself. So this is the first, uh, and I think one of the, probably the most important step. If you want to change something, then you need to start with yourself. Um, the second step then is um, if you, if you uh, have the awareness for your own humanity, then obviously you have a development and awareness for other people's humanity. You are no better than anyone else. So other people suffering in vulnerability is, is just the same. And you, from that point of view, the moment that you dive into that process of managing your, your basic functionalities um, or your basic faculties, uh, the better word, um, you start to develop compassion, empathy um, for what other people are going through. Um, so, uh, based on a better way of managing your your own and leading your own uh, self, um, you can then on progress into uh, leading others um, with uh, questions um, uh, like uh, uh, how to how to. Uh, connect uh, and, and build trusting environments, uh, how to create connection and belonging. Um, and the th based on that, there comes then a third level where you actually try, actually take the, the self-management leadership and the capability of leading others and then apply it to um, those positive changes that you want to see in the world. Um, so it's these three things, uh, self-management leadership, leading others, and leading change and transformation that um, constitutes my approach and has, that has evolved over time. And that I, that I would say is now something that I try to pass on to others. It's when I looked through it, you kindly shared it so we could, could take a look through it. And there are so many components because in that me part, the reviewing of the me, not only do you see growth opportunities, but you also have the opportunity to really embrace your strengths, which oftentimes we can overlook in that self-deprecation process that many of us tend to do because that negative brain bias because we mm. all have that so often and we can talk ourselves down. But when we get to know ourselves, not only are we finding our growth opportunities, but we also have that opportunity to find our strengths and what we bring to the table, right? Yeah. And so from what you were saying previously, where you're building that team and you're finding, okay, when I know the strengths of everyone on my team, then I can align everyone into the place where I empower them to draw out their strengths. And as they get to know even more about their strengths then we can move them around, it isn't like you set them and that's the only place they are. Uh, an organization is a moving thing. And so yeah. there's growth opportunity as the person grows, the organization grows and people can move around. And so as we've talked prior to this, there's always that mobility within the we as the me grows. And so that strategy that you're discussing, the me to the we, 
when we get into that community part of it, whether it's an organization or outside, then you can move around as you grow stronger and get to know yourself more. And then the community gets stronger through that as you integrate. Right. And so that's a beautiful part of this model is it's ever growing, ever changing. As you grow, we grow. As we grow, then we contribute more to the planet or the whole. And the evolution of that is infinite. It's amazing. Right. And obviously, strengths is, as, is only one side of the coin. It's also about um, the, the weaknesses that, that every one of us has as much as we have strengths. And I think it's as important to pay attention to those weaknesses because they are based on, um, on uh, something, mostly things that we experience in our formative years between age, between birth and two years of birth and uh, the first six years of our life. So, so instead of looking at a person and saying, hey, what's wrong with him or wrong with her? We should ask the question, what happened to him or what happened to her? Because when we do that, we, go, we don't approach the other human being judgmentally, but with compassion and empathy, um, there must have been some event that shaped that person in a certain way. Um, and helping to recognize that and also helping with developing uh, out of that, dealing with that, first of all, and then finding ways to uh, also uh, deal with the, the, the weaknesses is as important, uh, in my experience, as looking at, at the strengths. And uh, this is another extremely important um, task of, uh, of a heart leader, I would say. That's incredible. Yes, that removing of judgment, because we all love to categorize, right? Let's put you in this box here and set you over here with everyone else who goes in that box instead of, no, we don't need to label you or put you in a box. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's extremely, and here again, I think one of those major leadership traits is that as a leader of a team or of an organization, you need to be aware of the fact that you're no better than anyone else. It's you, you share a common humanity. You share the same um, basis of strengths and weaknesses of traumas and of, uh, of positive things that have come your way and that have shaped you as much as someone else. And I think this is so extremely important um, when it comes to, to leading. It has to do with uh, authenticity. It has to do with humility. It has to do with collaboration on eye level. Um, so it, it has to do with, with so much with, with gratitude uh, and awareness. So these kind of things are are absolutely key to um, developing the ability uh, to inspire our others, to um, help others, along with that, with uh, an ethos of serving others. Um, and I think this is a way of leadership that can be extremely effective. And I feel that we need that nowadays and in the near next future more than ever. Why? Because um, the world around us is becoming such an unpredictable unreality that the only way to really deal with it is to figure it out, not to find it out. And in order to figure it out, we have to fall back onto an inner compass. So Tim Cook, the, the CEO of Apple, recently said in an inauguration speech, speech, those of us who want to lead in the future need to do that from an inner compass. That's the inner compass that I talk about. Yeah, it has, it's our heart. It's our heart-based leadership, leadership of ourselves, leadership of others. And then um, translating that in dealing with the challenges um, of creating the positive changes that we need to see in this world. 
from that space, I know our focus this month is all around communication, right? Mm. When we're coming from that heart-centered space, that heart-based space, and we're navigating conflict, because it will happen, and many people shy away from conflict, right? right? It's not something that's easy to address. Yeah. What advice might you offer someone to navigate through conflict in that heart-centered way, but still come at it from that authentic, okay, let's just navigate this, not shy from it or not go too aggressively at it? I mean, there are so many different things we can do, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it it, it starts with the simple fact that um, accepting conflict as a part of life, right? So, um, so, so con- conflict is nothing extraordinary. Um, and there's uh, something like the magic ratio, ratio in healthy relationships. So um, every healthy relationship has on average one conflict-laden interaction for every five positive interactions. Yeah, that's, that's a rough rule of thumb so you need to accept it as a fact of life to begin with and then don't suppress conflict but handle it constructively Um, and that's extremely important in business because every unaddressed conflict uh, at at work has the potential to waste many hours um, uh, in in gossip and unproductive behavior so it's, it's really important to deal with it and to deal with it constructively. And there are, a few, there are a few principles to deal with that. So one is responsibility. You need to take responsibility. And it's 100% your responsibility uh, to stay centered and connected and keep the other party centered and connected. So this is one principle. A second one is um, intention. Maintain a positive intention all throughout. So bring your heart into the conflict. A third one is, um, um, and I think that's even more important, it's it's non-attachment. Don't be attached to any specific outcome or any specific path this conflict resolution is supposed to take, but be open to what what unfolds. Um, Another one is, unconditional respect. So no, no matter how upsetting uh, a behavior um, you might encounter, um, always show unconditional respect, not only towards the other party, as much as to yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and the last uh, point I would say is, um, is full engagement. So be fully present. Um, be fully attentive to the situation, its nuances, uh, its thoughts, feelings, needs. Again, in a mutual way, your parties as much as your own. Um, So I think those are five key principles um, uh, for dealing um, with uh, conflicts. And a very important question then is, um, how do you, how do you, communicate in uh, a conflict situations. Very often um, uh, emotion gets mixed up with with facts and you get very quickly uh, uh, offensive or defensive behavior. And uh, this is mostly very detrimental to to reaching uh, constructive outcomes. And one method- uh, Everyone gets triggered. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, like, I mean, everyone encounters that uh, every day, maybe. Um, you never listen when I talk, for example. Well, <laughs> if you, there's, there's an immediate attack on the other person in a factual uh, thing that you would like to share, right? And um, there's a method that's called um, uh, uh, nonviolent uh, communication. Um, it was developed by Marshall B. Rosenberg, a psychologist, uh, which is nothing new, but it's basically a, a, a combination, a compilation 
of a lot of things that we knew for a long time, but it's very, very effective. And it's, it's, it's four levels that you, uh, or four steps in a communication process that you, that you follow. One is um, observation. So share an observation of the fact, what is actually on the table. Um, uh, and I, I give you an example right, uh, right away. The second one is share the information. How does it make you, you feel, right? Um, the third thing is um, clearly uh, formulate a need. What do you need in order to change your emotional state to a different one, a more positive one? And then there's a request to the other party to take a certain action in order to do that, right? So if you, if you take a situation, uh, for example, again, a business situation, yeah? Instead of saying, um, you often don't listen to me when I'm speaking, right? You can say, in our meeting today, I noticed that you were on the phone while I was presenting or I was speaking, right? That's the observation. The second thing is, um, the emotion, it brings up in me the emotion of not being valued for what I have to say, right? That's how you might feel in that situation. Third, I need to know that I have my partner's attention when I'm speaking, right? So you're clearly expressing a need. And then you're expressing um, a request to the other party, which might be, would you please not your, use your phone while I'm speaking, right? So you're, you're keeping this whole emotion mixes up with all the other parts out and structure it in a way that the other actually also can follow and understand because that's, that's, that's the whole point of doing that. It's a method that is directed at increasing empathy, understanding, and constructive behavior. Because at the end of such a, a process, you would like to have a, basically a win-win outcome, right? Ideally, uh, you would like to have uh, that something happens based on your intent. So this is a way to, to really help you do that. It's a wonderful way to organize it so that it's not just a reaction. Right. It is a response. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that one. I always experience that to be very helpful. I try to do my best to apply it as much as I can, but I'm no saint. And uh, again and again in uh, situations that are very emotionally heated, I catch myself also to fall back into, uh, the, you know, the, the typical behavior of you did this and this, uh, you know, and it's, but it's with practice, like with everything, you get better and better at it. Exactly. And being able to give yourself grace when you do have those moments. I think that's equally as important as you were saying. We have to be willing to look at our growth opportunities or where we're not perfect right. because ultimately that allows us to be human too. Yeah. And in CEO level positions or any position within an organization, we have to be transparent and real with each other. Yeah. And if we set this standard of separation and you talked about it in the beginning, these silos, right? And we create this hierarchy and mm -hmm. suddenly we start to feel like, no, I'm better than you because I'm perfect. And my actions are you're here and I'm here. Then mm -hmm. there's all this segregation instead of integration. And then we don't feel like we're in it together. And that yeah. includes not being perfect. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so this, you, you, you come to a very important point, Amber. Um, and this is. Coming up, uh, back again to my experience that I had when I came into this organization, um, again, you have this threat and fear-based leadership combined with highly siloed organizations. And in many situations, people had been completely deprived of their self-efficacy. 
-hmm. They couldn't see the, the meaning and the outcome of their own contributions and came into doing what they had to do without knowing where where they are basically this is like this is like driving in the dark and at a uh, thick fog um, and it can only produce high risk yeah it becomes an accident and a coincident if you produce the right right outcome yeah yeah so one one of the um you asked me if, uh, what I did in these kind of situations, and I focused very much on um, helping people to re-experience their self-efficacy, uh, to recognize really what their contributions are, um, and to create uh, more corporate unity. And there are a number of ways uh, to do that. And I just give you a few examples. So one of the things was, I said to start out with is telling the truth. So sharing really with people and giving them the full uh, story and the full uh, uh, unmasked truth of where the company is, why we have to change and a vision of where we need to go. So this is one thing. And doing that on a regular basis, I had, um, I had uh, held town meetings every four weeks. And town meeting meant I had um, very widespread organizations which were distributed uh, across the, the whole uh, nation or even internationally. So some people at the, at the headquarters where I were, um, were would attend that um, offline physically and the others would be virtually online. And we would uh, present, uh, for example, uh, the, the current state of the business, uh, the strategy, um, successes, or also uh, failures that we had. And then it, we would open up for questions, right? And do get into a constant uh, dialogue. And it might, might have been just an hour uh, to do that, but we did this on a regular basis. Um, uh, another thing, uh, that I did was um, was so-called ventures. Ventures were um, was a method, uh, a team-based method for solving problems. So, one of the example from my last company, last last turnaround um, situation, there was a an insanely intense bureaucracy, and um, we set up a project that was called what doesn't add value needs to go. And we tendered uh, this project into the entire organization said, who would like to be part of that? Yeah, we we're gonna set up a project team, 15 people. Um, we're not gonna handpick anyone. Everyone can apply voluntarily. And then we are gonna put a, a, an algorithm to work that selects people just based on anonymous and diversity-based criteria. So tenure with the company, age, gender, uh, uh, function in the company, et cetera. I just wanted to have the most diverse team, diverse 15 people that would then embark on, uh, in this case, when we first started it, a six to eight week sprint they would dedicate 20% of their time in addition to what they, no, not, not in addition, we made the deal with the, the rest of the organization that they had to be, their time engagement had to be uh, uh, matched uh, with their home uh, organization. And they would meet um, uh, every week for one or two uh, days to work in a workshop style. The trick of that was that these teams were fully um, f fully empowered and fully responsible. So from identifying the problem, coming up with ideas, uh, coming up with developing solutions and implementing them, no one had the authority to step in. Not me as a CEO, no board member, no one. No one had to intervene with anything they came up with. We had the obligation to support them. That was it. So they were they were the ones who actually 
for this specific project did everything and they were, were responsible for it. And this was highly successful. And we, we then started to cascade this down as our way of solving problems. Might it be small, might it be tactical, might it be even strategic issues uh, in all parts of the organization. So this venture based of problem solving. Um, a third thing that I did, um, which was again, extremely effective was I made a decision that any kind of project in the organization had to be staffed uh, cross organizationally and multifunctionally, right? Um, and again, whatever it might have been, might it be logistics, might it be finance, et cetera, we needed to bring in those different kinds of diverse kinds of uh, perspectives um, because it creates much better uh, solutions. Uh, it helps you really look at problems from different angles and it helps also to, um, to produce much more solid and robust solutions because you have looked at it and developed it from, from different angles. And this became another rule that uh, we used throughout the organization. And again, it came back to the organization uh, experiencing self-efficacy and it helped create a, or recreate in that case, a feeling, hey, we are all in here together. We are all contributing with our different selves together on a specific solution and no one is better than someone else. And we are all stronger as a team. And by doing that, we all of a sudden started to turn around things. You know, um, people started to, to see, hey, we can be successful. Um, and I know what my colleague is doing. I'm not reduced to this little box that I was previous, previously um, uh, told to fill and just to optimize its, its efficiency. No, I'm, I'm part of the whole process, for example, that is focused on a customer. Um, and this created purpose-driven families around certain core items or certain uh, uh, challenges that a customer had. What an empowering feeling, not only creating the culture, being empowered within the organization, but understanding how that met a need in your community. Like there's just a whole flow that right. goes along with that, that then creates the financial return. Yes. So it isn't as though it wasn't additionally financially successful yeah. in the long run that then creates longevity of an organization. Yes. So. It creates longevity, it cre creates resilience. And um, again, it, it, it broke up this previous system and that I saw as my key responsibility as a CEO um, to create an environment where such a, a way of tackling problems, problems, uh, solving problems was able to thrive. So it was trust-based. It was also a failure embracing uh, uh, leadership. Um, I, at one point, I had a CEO award out for, um, for the best failure, not to incentivize people to make, a, to, make to, to, to screw up, I'm sorry, but to really um, incentivize people to share what went wrong and what, what did we learn from it. Yes. This is another thing that when you do that, you open up a channel for um, uh, yeah, people, people sharing what, uh, first of all, knowing what worked and what didn't work. And you, you then open up the space for dealing with failures in a constructive way because you extract the learnings and nobody's penalized for making a mistake. But you see again, uh, as much as you saw conflict as a part of a normal relationship, you see failure as part of a normal process of trying to create value, right? Yes, I love that. In our last two minutes here, because it goes by way too fast, 
Oh, it does. <laughs> it goes away so fast. Um, we'll make certain that everyone knows how to get a hold of your information for any mentorship type things. But along with that, if you were to give a clarion call out to other heart leaders, what would you send out? What message as this beacon of heart leadership that you are, what would that message be? Um, I would say, be brave to uh, embark on a constant journey of trying to bring out the best in yourself and in others. Um, and uh, believe in people, believe in people's potential. Um, don't take them for who they are, but for what they can be. And uh, help people uh, to, to find or create their purpose and to actually bring it to life. And um, when I think of the term heart leader, then I see someone like, um, do you know, Professor John Keating in the Dead Poets Society? You know that movie? Yes, it's one of my favorite, all time favorites. <laughs> well, this is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is, you know, an individual, a leader who's opening spaces, who believes in their potential, that supports them, create meaning in their lives. And, and on their way, it supports them on the way to become the best version of themselves and says, make your life extraordinary. And it's all where it's, where it's all start. And I think that's the, um, that's the, that's the core um, of everything. So try to know and manage yourself the best you can and try to help others and work towards a greater good, no matter what it is. Thank you. And thank you for being with us, for sharing your wisdom and for inspiring so many organizations and individuals and inspiring me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amber, for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on another episode of the Heart Leader Podcast, where heart and mind align. I am your host, Amber, and this month we are talking all about communication across multiple avenues of your life. Don't forget, you can get this month's resource, the Effective Communication Guidebook, over in the Heart Leader Toolbox. We'll make sure there are tons of amazing links for you to explore, including how to get a hold of Stefan, how to get a hold of that free resource all below. So take a moment, explore down there. Until next time, I look forward to seeing you in the Suivera community. You've been listening to the Heart Leader Podcast with your host, Amber where heart and mind align. Tune in weekly as we take a deeper dive into what it means to be a heart leader. Ready to take the next step? Join us and over 1 million people worldwide who've united in creating this global movement of love. Become a heart leader for today and tomorrow. Learn more and connect with us at suivera.org.